Well, great. Well, thank you, Serge. A, a great pleasure being here today. Uh, very interesting meeting. Uh, and nice to see, uh, speaking at too many CME events, Thai food being served for the lunch, which, which really is, is quite a nice uh, change from kind of the steamed salmon, you know, and the steamer tray chicken. So uh, very interesting. So uh, I'm supposed to set really the stage for the discussion today, really around why and how we use cytoreduction in ET and PV. Uh, and I'll make a couple provocative comments as we go along uh, as we realize that many of our current, quote, indications really have flowed from uh, adjustments and preconceptions around the limitations of hydrea as opposed to necessarily meeting the needs of the patients with ET and P-Vera. Here are my disclosures. I'm obviously involved with many different clinical trials. So we're going to focus really on four topics. One, really the burden of ET and PV, briefly. Two, what are our current guidelines for cytoreductive therapy use in these patients, response assessment, and what is uncontrolled or poorly controlled disease? So the case is actually the case that was put into the question. I apologize, there were a couple there, I think, in transmission of email on accept. Uh, was missing for some of you who wondered what the correct answer was on a couple of those, but we'll, we'll correct that along the way. But the case, very illustrative of the challenges we face. So 63-year-old had a CVA with hemiparesis, was treated with TPA, and had resolution of their deficit. They were heavily symptomatic, spleen was palpable, hemoglobin was 17.8, white count 16, platelets elevated, EPO undetectable, marrow JAK2 mutated, 35% allele burden. So what is their diagnosis? Well, according to the WHO criteria in 2008, this individual may not necessarily fit the diagnosis of polycythemia vera, although I think many of us would agree that they do in fact have polycythemia vera. Uh, the major criteria in 2008 having the cutoff in the continuous variable of erythrocytosis with hemoglobins that are over 18.5, the presence of a JAK2 mutation, and then minor criteria. And limitations of these criteria are primarily that whenever we have really a continuous variable, you know, we sacrifice, you know, sensitivity and specificity interchangeably, and this is such an example. Now, to address this, there is a proposed revision that likely will go through with polycythemia vera reducing the degree of erythrocytosis necessary to 16 and a half in men, where this individual would then meet this criteria. Bone marrow changes, as well as the presence of a JAK2 mutation, with minor criteria being a subnormal serum erythropoietin level. So these will be more sensitive perhaps slightly increase the risk of a false positive, although I think with all of these features, still I think the rate of false positivity would likely be quite low. Now for this individual case, we really try to think about both in terms of our choice of cytoreductive therapy, both risk and burden. In terms of risk, this individual, as I'll show you, would be considered high risk for many reasons. One is age, two, a prior thrombotic event and a resolved CVA would fit in that category, three, leukocytosis. In terms of burden, I think burden overlaps with risk but aren't necessarily interchangeable with risk. So this individual is heavily symptomatic, they have splenomegaly, they have ongoing needs for phlebotomies, and they've had a vascular event. Now, how do we assess risk? Well, there have been uh, many publications regarding risk in MPNs. Specifically for P. vera, the most recent analysis have found in multivariate analysis that age, leukocytosis, and prior events are the most important in terms of predicting the risk of vascular events. Now, the risk of vascular events is important, although it does not really summarize the total burden an individual has with their disease but it is an important uh, event which we wish to prophylax against. So it is relevant, but I would offer that it is not the only consideration we have when managing patients with P. vera. 
Now, indeed, as we try to think about the burden of the disease in MPNs, we have the risk of vascular events in PV and ET in particular, although they clearly can occur in patients with myelofibrosis. There can be issues of cytopenias. These clearly are much more common in myelofibrosis, but can exist in the setting of excess myelosuppression for uh, ET and PV. The risk of progression is a major concern. I saw three individuals at the beginning of this week for consults who were all in their 20s with either ET, PV, or one with PMF. And clearly for them, the risk of progression is really their greatest concern. Splenomegaly. This can range from being really a biomarker to being a severe burden. They clearly can have symptomatic burden, although this too is variable. And of course, we must be very mindful of comorbidities. Now, our group has been very active trying to quantify symptomatic burden, looking at issues of fatigue, spleen symptoms, constitutional and quality of life. We created myelofibrosis-specific tools. We subsequently have validated additional questions which are relevant in ET and PV as well for currently the myeloproliferative neoplasm symptom form. This has been validated in many languages. Now with this, we identify, as you will see in patients with green, that individuals with myelofibrosis are the most symptomatic. However, what is underappreciated is how prevalent significant symptoms are amongst patients with ET and Pivera. And these are not untreated patients. These are patients on current cytoreductive therapies, primarily hydroxyurea, a much smaller number on an agrolide and to some degree reinforcing the, the impression that these therapies have not been overly efficacious in decreasing symptomatic burden. Indeed, when we look in this somewhat busy slide, but it is a heat map, which shows the distribution of symptomatic quartiles, more symptomatic patients in the fourth quartile, you see the unmet need in this half of the patients with ET and P. vera who have very symptomatic needs. Now, other ways we've tried to quantify the burden is, one, a fatigue project using a variety of instruments. We identified in 1,800 patients with MPNs, uh, many of whom had ET or P. vera, that these individuals can have significant issues related to mood due to the anxiety, stress, and uncertainty of having an MPN, and that these are also important considerations as we think about long-term management of their disease. A parallel study called the Landmark Study, we try to assess the impact on lifestyle and employment. We identified in these 800 patients with MPNs that anxiety and symptoms are major difficulties both in P. vera and ET, and that impact on both uh, activities, employment, uh, early retirement, all of these things are very prevalent even amongst patients with PV and ET. So to give you a sense of the burden, the burden is broad. And the burden is not only vascular events, although that clearly is very relevant as well. So what are our current guidelines for cytoreductive therapy use? Well, currently, I will say we do not really have formal guidelines. Serge and I and others in the room are involved with NCCN creating the first set of MPN guidelines. And there is a very strict process for which guidelines are generated in terms of vetting the data. Up to the moment, we have had primarily consensus-based guidelines. People get around the table in a room such as this, sometimes not a room as nice as this. Uh, and Serge and I have been in those sorts of rooms, and we've come up with, with agreements as to how we think these diseases can be treated. Now, many of these consensus criteria, people sometimes will claim it's a consensus where actually nobody in the room believes exactly the final product because it is a compromise between many. And this is probably one such example, although there are clearly important things that we can pull out. One, we all agreed that control of hematocrit was important. Low-dose aspirin has been felt to be important. Aggressive control of cardiovascular risk factors is felt to be important, although not truly defined. But then cytoreduction, again, based on really opinion, was high risk, intolerance to phlebotomy for P. vera, 
increasing splenomegaly, severe symptoms, extreme thrombocytosis, or progressive leukocytosis. So all of those being ideas around the room, or what would lead you to treat someone with cytoreductive therapy? I would offer that all of our decisions regarding cytoreductive therapy have really flowed from our love-hate relationship with hydroxyurea. You know, by the same token, people love hydroxyurea, it's easy and cheap, and people have concerns about how safe it is to use for the long term. And coming from a very sun-filled valley in Arizona, I could tell you that just the cutaneous issues alone in people who face 300 days of sunshine a year are not irrelevant. So these have really been the primary driver of how we've adjusted our therapy, as well as the focus solely on the prevention of vascular events as the only therapeutic goal that has been uh, challenged. Additionally, the lack of confidence that the therapy was disease altering. So as I share with some patients, our current approaches of observation or aspirin alone might be akin to other very conservative approaches with diabetes, lupus, or other diseases where we would not intervene in long-term chronic illnesses. Now with this, there have been criteria which have been developed defining hydroxyurea failure, and these are strict and for clinical trials, but we recognize it really is a spectrum. Hydroxyurea resistance or intolerance has been somewhat in the eye of the beholder. Now what about response? Response, again, again, by consensus, have focused on really trying to quantify all the different ways we hope to have benefit. A complete remission in ET or PV, having being improvement in symptoms, counts, no vascular events, and the marrow. Partial being all of those factors except improvement in the marrow, no real clinical improvement in ET or PV, and molecular response still being held as uh, experimental and needing to be validated. And indeed, it is important that we consider validation of our endpoints, particularly for ET and PV. We've learned even in the myelofibrosis space that as consensus, we agreed that a greater than 50% reduction in the palpable length is what we thought was clinically relevant. We then translated this into volumetric reduction for being able to use this in clinical trials, but then really have found that there was a much lower threshold of volume reduction that actually was correlated with an improvement in survival in the setting of the comfort studies. So again, we can pick arbitrary numbers, but we do have to circle back to them to see how relevant they are. So what is uncontrolled or poorly controlled disease? Well, as we think about the burden and different ways that ET, PV can impact patients, again, we really are looking at the entire patient. Is it uncontrolled proliferation? Is it recurring vascular events or threatening vascular events? Is it symptoms which are not controlled? Is it evidence of progression? All of these may be considerations, and I think as we look at other potential targeted therapies, whether it be interferons, whether it be JAK inhibition, whether it be other agents in development, I think we need to look across the full spectrum of these issues. Now, ruxolitinib has been approved in PVERA in a similar format, recognizing that individuals on the response study who had failed hydroxyurea were randomized between ruxolitinib and best alternative therapy. And was demonstrated, again, kind of a multifactorial way of assessing benefit. Control of counts, reduction of spleen, improvement in symptoms, less thrombotic events. When we quantified their symptomatic burden, we saw that it was significant. And that JAK inhibition in these groups of individuals was very impactful, independent of really the issue of thrombotic events or no thrombotic events, realizing that this itself was an important endpoint of a composite endpoint. We identified that these patients have many unmet needs, and as we have teased apart in this uh, publication, which is at, in press at JCO, the presence of splenomegaly alone is a sign of more problematic polycythemia vera. The presence of having failed hydroxyurea is a sign of a more difficult polycythemia vera. And requiring phlebotomies, particularly after the first year of diagnosis at a great frequency, 
again, is a subset that are more problematic polycythemia vera. So what is uncontrolled ET and PV? These are the various risk factors which we identify. And from my end, I think uncontrolled is really a spectrum of difficulties. Difficulties controlling the counts, difficulties tolerating phlebotomy, difficulties with microvascular symptoms, subtle issues of progression, all of these are relevant uh, in addition to our concerns regarding the risk of thrombosis. So as I think about patients with PV and ET in 2015, I think the initial assessment is an accurate diagnosis as well as an assessment of risk and symptoms, control of hematocrit where appropriate, and low-dose aspirin. Frontline set of reduction is here where we have the discussion which we'll have in the subsequent talks regarding hydrea and interferon, and then subsequently the both investigational agents and ruxolidinum as second line in P. vera. So I'll conclude by saying that ET and PV have variable burdens and risk. The risk of vascular events are not always interchangeable with disease burden. Current guidelines are consensus-based, but primarily have had thrombotic events as the only focus. The concerns of hydrea toxicity has really had very profound impact on our treatment patterns, and uncontrolled ET and PV have many potential manifestations. I obviously would like to thank my group who helps with all of these efforts. And many of the efforts I've shown you clearly are collaborative in nature. And return it to our esteemed chair. Thank you. <laughs>